Uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Hirdink. I'm the managing member of Tribe Public. Uh, I'm based out here in San Francisco, and I'm happy to be here today. Uh, remember, our website is tribepublic.com, T-R-I-B-E public.com. Um, please note that I'm also the managing director of registered investment advisor uh, in California called Vista Partners. That website is vistapglobal.com. Note that I'm invested in the company uh, today uh, that we have on Modular Medical, NASDAQ, MODD, uh, and also view uh, the laundry list of disclaimers that I have at Tribe Public's website and at Vista's website. Um, thank you so much for coming today. And many of you know this, but we have members uh, that are coming in from 27 countries to our uh, webinar events. As well, here in the U.S., we've uh, began uh, our march across the U.S. to what we call tribe cities, where we're hosting leaders of companies that you, the tribe, choose to, to meet and or want to learn more from. And you do that through a simple wish list process that we have at the tribe public website where you submit a name of the CEO, name of the company, ticker, and if we get enough interest then we will approach those uh, leaders of companies you care about to try to get them either on a webinar or both on in, in in-person events. And we typically do those events in your tribe city with a group of you in a private room at a, uh, a week at a luncheon event. And you get that direct corporate access that uh, an understanding that it's really hard to, to read on paper, if you will, or in digital these days, as, as you as you might say. But um, but again, thank you for coming today. Um, uh, please note that you can, if you already haven't submitted your uh, questions for the CEO as you're listening, please just submit through the, the Zoom chat feature. We'll do our best to get them addressed. If we don't get them all here, we'll look to get our uh, co-host from Modular Med Medical, uh, the CEO, Jeb Besser, uh, to address the Metal Leader event. Um, again, thank you. And the, uh, today's event is titled Diabetes Care for the Rest of Us. Interesting title, interesting concept. Um, done a lot of the due diligence here. Very excited about what uh, Jeb has to say today. And we're going to have him pull up his PowerPoint. Um, and then we'll, uh, uh, for so call it 15, 20 minutes, and let us tell us his story. And then submit your QA, and we'll do our best to get those addressed right after that short suite. And uh, we'll get on with the rest of our work day. And, and hopefully, you'll discover and learn a great deal today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeb. Can you, uh, thanks for pulling that up and uh, please take it away for us. Great. Thanks, John. Appreciate the introduction. And, uh, and it's always good to hear that you're an investor <laughs> and, and that you like what you see so far. So I, I hope other people who attend this uh, also find what we have to say interesting. So we're Modular Medical. Uh, we're a, we're based in San Diego, California. I'll flip through the necessary disclaimers on my end too. Uh, we're based in San Diego, California, and we are we were founded by Paul DePerna, who was the founder and first CEO of Tandem Diabetes, TN, ticker TNDM on the NASDAQ, which is, believe it or not, back in 2011, the last major company to introduce a product in the insulin pump space. And he has 70 patents in microfluidics and designed our current product. So, um, you know, I think... Where, the wearable diabetes space is an interesting space. And the first question that you probably immediately jumps to mind as we look at this market is, what's an insulin pump? Why would why do you need it? And aren't there already $3 billion plus companies serving this market? Why is there room for a little $30 million company in this space? And so let's answer those questions one at a time. First of all, why an insulin pump? Why do people wear them? And what's the advantage? And the advantage is that they are the gold standard in glycemic control for people with, with diabetes. And the reason is two, twofold. One, they give you a slow basal drip of half your insulin, and they allow you to bolus more frequently when you're about to have a meal by pushing a button discreetly rather than excusing yourself and pulling out needles, vials, and, and all the rest of it. And we know that that slow basal drip plus the combination of smaller, more frequent bolusing keeps you closer to baseline than you ever could get with needles for most people. And that is an enormous advantage because we know the long-term damage that comes from diabetes is the 
the retinopathy, the diabetic foot ulcers, the cardiovascular damage, that's, and the hospitalizations come from these massive excursions from baseline that come from the unnatural ups and downs of people's insulin levels. So insulin pumps are best in class care. However, even though they're best, and, and they're not only best in class care, they save lot the system lots of money. If you wear an insulin pump and you're a person with diabetes, the healthcare system saves $10,000 a year on you, fully loaded, including a $5,000 placeholder for the cost of a pump. So you would think with three large companies already in the space, Medtronic, still with 40% share that bought the original Minimed, Tandem, which was introduced in 2011, and in the Insulin Omnipod, which is the fastest growing product in the space right now, you would think the insurers would be all over pushing these products, but they are not. They make it hard for you to adopt because their big, their biggest fear is that they're going to buy you a four or $5,000 medical device and it will become a paperweight because you simply can't handle the device or don't like the device for one of three general reasons. We call them the three C's. Too costly, too complex, too cumbersome. These devices are extremely complex, they often have form factors that are undesirable because they were designed respectively for Medtronic in 1993, 1994, Insulin Omnipod in 2001, and the Tandem T-Slim in 2006, 2007. So they are beautifully engineered, old pieces of technology that do a very good job of helping you manage your disease if you're willing to spend the 30 to 60 minutes a day required and learn all the ins and outs of the features and features that they offer. And so the people that have adopted pumps are the best insured, most motivated, most technically sophisticated users. And the adoption in the rest of the market has been very, very slow. In fact, if you look on the right, on the right side of this slide, one in three Americans with type one diabetes are on a pump. And that number is roughly unchanged since 2006. So, that's a huge unmet need. The number of type twos who have gone on a pump has gone from zero to about 8%, eight or 9%. So that's gone up a little bit, but that still means that nine out of 10 type twos who require daily insulin aren't on a pump. And that's not good. <laughs> and the final proof here is 21% of type ones were making it, are making their ADA targets right now. That number was the same number in 2006. We've taken the people who were probably already the best motivated, best organized, best insured and made their care even better. But we haven't moved the middle because the current products are like that $2,000 latte machine you have on your kitchen counter. If you spin all the knobs just right and you move all the levers just right, it makes a great cup of coffee. But most people have a Keurig because it's 10 to 20% of the work and gives you 80 to 90% of the benefit. And there's no product like that in this space. And that is what we aspire to be. Um, now, the first... An obvious pushback here is, well, Jeb, the reason that people haven't broadly adopted these products is because, more broadly adopted these products is because they simply won't wear anything at all. And the problem with that thesis is that there's another product, the continuous glucose monitor, that people need to wear all the time in order to get better results managing their glycemic care. And penetration of CGMs is four times pumps now, <laughs> four times. So four times as many people are willing to wear this product all the time to help manage their diabetes as a pump. Why? What's so different about the CGM market? And we think it's this. You might have seen this product advertised at the pharmacy. You might have seen it advertised on TV. It's the Abbott Freestyle Libre. And when yeah. it was introduced in 2016, Dexcom had been on the market for six years and had cleaned Medtronic and Roche's clock, <laughs> taken most of the share, had the best-in-class platform, and... When Abbott introduced the Freestyle Libre, the key opinion leaders said, why does anyone want this poor man's Dexcom? Because it was less accurate than Dexcom. Dexcom, every time it took a sample, was accurate to within 8%. Libre only within 14 Libre didn't have a finger stick to calibrate it in the morning, but, people, but the KOL said, well, why does that matter? People with diabetes prick themselves all the time. Why wouldn't you want to prick yourself once for better accuracy? It didn't have a real-time feed. You had to wave the wand over it in order to know, or your phone over it to know what your number was 
and it didn't offer patient portals so that your family could see what your numbers were at all times. It didn't offer the alarms that, that um, as soon as you went out of range would go off on a Dexcom. But you see what happened. Five years later, Abbott Freestyle Libre was doing as much revenue and had as many users as Dexcom did. <laughs> the dead stop. But Dexcom kept growing too because they're fundamentally different audiences. If you surveyed a Dexcom user back in 2016, and we did, they said things like, I work hard and I get better results managing my diabetes. <laughs> when you surveyed a Libre user, they said, I like this product because it makes my life easier. I don't have to calibrate this in the morning. That's one more thing I don't have to do for my diabetes. I like the fact that I only want to know my number when I want to know my number. I don't want the patient portal because my family yells at me for having chocolate cake with lunch. I don't want the real-time alarms because then people judge me for being a person with diabetes when they go off around my coworkers. So they have a fundamentally, the lack of features for the Freestyle Libre were features. So now we think that the Freestyle Libre users are coming back to their endocrinologist five, six years later and saying, you know what? I see how bad my numbers are now. I want to do better, but I have friends who wear each of the existing three devices and I'm not doing that. What do you have for me? And since 2011, the answer is I have nothing for you. Try harder, which is not a very satisfactory answer in a space where diabetes is a disease of everyone. Different levels of socioeconomic background, education, motivation, organization. You can't make people be more motivated or more tech savvy. You have to bring the product to them. And that's what we aspire to do. So do the doctors agree with us? We surveyed 10% of the endocrinologists in the United States, and we asked them if there was a pump that was easier to use, less full featured, and um, easier to train on, less bells and whistles, what percentage of your multiple daily injectors, and this is critical, we're not trying to take people who are, who are happy with their current pump therapy off of their pump and convince them to use a less full featured product. We're trying to get people who have rejected the current pumps for a long time to adopt technology to make their care better. And so we said, what percentage of your multiple daily injectors would you put on a pump that fit these features? And they said one in four. And that's how we size our $3 billion market. But they don't just say one in four. They usually list off five, 10, sometimes even 15 people that they who come into their practice every month who say, I want a pump, but. And right now, the answer to that but has not been available in almost 15 years. So the patients agree. So we surveyed thousands of multiple daily injectors and said, would you ever consider going on a pump? 45% said, yes, I would go on a pump, but make it easy for me to learn, easy for my doctor to prescribe, easy to get reimbursement. And the bottom line is if it takes more than 10 minutes a day for me to manage, I'm not doing it. And unfortunately, I'm not doing it no matter what happens to me 15 or 20 years down the road. I'm already just too burdened by what's happening. So got to bring the product to the patient. And, and before I leave this, I should also tell you like, when I say that these current products are sophisticated and complex, um, you know, the Medtronic Miniman has 1,300 user-definable features. Tandem T-Slim has almost as many, and the Insulet Omnipod is at almost 1,000. And if you configure your pump wrong, you can die. So it's a daunting prospect for someone to learn right out of the gate as a consumer-facing product. So how do we address these, these questions? So this is our product. The insulin, sorry, the Mod 1 insulin delivery for most pumpers. Here it is. It is a patch pump like the insulin Omnipod, but it's two parts. This part is a 90-day reusable that you we give you for free every 90 days, and it clicks on top of the disposable cartridge right here and clicks together with about the complexity of McDonald's Happy Meal. It's eight steps. One of them is, is the light on, and one of them is... Have you washed your hands? <laughs> so yeah. click sweat, you fill it up with insulin, click this together, you put it on your body and away you go for three days. And then you discard the cart, separate, discard the cartridge, put another one in, continue on. What's preferable about this form factor to the others? Well, if you haven't seen the other devices. So this is the Medtronic Mini Med. This is, and, and just way of comparison size wise. So this is our product. You would wear on your arm or your abdomen. And this is the mini med, which you would wear on your belt, in your pocket or on your thigh, 
And this is the 48 inches of tubing that is going to be going into your abdomen for the rest of your life. And then that 1300 options, you have to access using this fancy little control panel right here. Yeah, it's got the arrows like you had on the old yeah. device. Yeah, yeah, no, it is it is it is a, I think it's a, a navigation system comparable to like a Microsoft Zoom, if you remember <laughs> that product. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny, so, Jeb, it's, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, no, please. We had to, when I had you out in Arizona at the uh, the tribe events in Scottsdale and Peoria, and you shipped in these devices, and w uh, pe when people could pick them up and feel them, it just you could just see it in their faces and in their hands, and then how e you know how different and how the the advantages that you're describing were very clear. And I wish I could th put pull these through in some hologram form for people to do so in in this, but I'm not quite that yeah. savvy. But yeah. um, it is it was amazing and clear how differentiated they were, and also how clunky, you know, that technology. Imagine using a cell phone from the '90s or for something that was developed starting in the '90s to now. I mean, that's it's a very similar comparison to me because I mean, you used to have these monster phones, right? And then you now you have these devices. I just so I have a big screen, but I can do everything in the world at the same time. It's the easiest thing I've ever used today, right? An iPhone, you anyone can use one, right? So th I think that's similar to what you're doing here. Well, look, I think it's it's clear that people don't love this form factor. And, and by the way, just for way of comparison, so here's the tandem T-Slim that Paul invented that was the last product introduced on the market. So this also would have 48 inches of tubing. It has a touch screen. It's heavy. It's a little smaller than the Mini Med. Um, so these two are losing share right now to this, the Insulate Omnipod. And this product, obviously size-wise, looks a lot like ours. Um, when you take it out of the package. But the problem with this one is that you throw it away. It's kind of, it's pretty wasteful. You throw the entire pumping mechanism away every three days, which is expensive. And then once you put the insulin Omnipod on your arm or on your abdomen, you cannot take it off for three days. If you do, you lose the insulin inside, any remaining insulin and you lose the pump itself and insurance won't pay for more than one pod every three days. So you knock it off on a door frame, that's an expensive mistake. People really don't like that. People, but people also don't like the fact that you're tethered to your disease once again, because you put the Omnipod on and now you can't take it off for three days. And that's a constant reminder. Whereas ours, you can put it on pause, set it to the side. You want to go for a swim. You want to play tennis. You want to be intimate. You want to go on a date. You can do all of those things and not lose your pump and make an economic decision about whether or not that's worth it to you. So, um, and then a lot of people, because this can't fall off, a lot of people dislike the power of the adhesive. 20% of the patient, we've heard numbers as high as 20% of the patients get dermatitis underneath the device. A lot of people with thin skin find it extremely uncomfortable to peel it off at the end of the three days. And then from a practical perspective, the most likely place that you're going to get a jam in one of these products is at the injection site. Mm -hmm. inclusion. And the injection site for an Omnipod, while it's very slick because it's an auto injector that, ha that fires underneath the device and then withdraws and leaves a soft cannula, it can only ever fire once. So that's why you can only put it on once. And the most likely area for it to jam is right at the point of injection underneath the device. So how do you clear an occlusion? You lift it up. Oh, wait. Now the product is garbage anyway. So, so that's the Omnipod. And I'm being unfair to my own product because the Omnipod might be about the same size as our product, but it doesn't work without this. It needs a second cell phone, a lockdown second cell phone in order to work. And that's fundamentally, and let now, so people don't like this. They don't like the idea of a second cell phone that they have to manage that doesn't, where their pump won't work if their phone isn't charged. So they have all the charging anxiety related to this. This one takes AA batteries that you have to put in so you have to carry around AA batteries or your pump might not work. T-Slim, you have to charge it at night while it's on your body. If you've ever worn a medical device while charging at night on your body, you can understand why that why people might not want that. So we we have a battery integrated into our disposable three-day cartridge. At the end of the three days, you unclick this, you throw it away, you get a new battery. So, And everything you need to do with this pump, with our pump, you can do with this button. No external controller, no nothing. Just push a button and you can get, you can get, you can prime, 
You can start the pump to get your basal and you can bolus yourself. And we'll have a simple app on the phone where it'll tell you, yeah, it's on. Yeah, you just bolus yourself. You probably don't want to do that. But in general, this next group of adopters don't want anything else except the device itself and very limited management. Also, we think a lot of people like the insulate form factor, but this only holds two mLs of insulin and 25% of all type ones and 65% of all type twos can't get through three days on two mLs. They need three. If you need three and you're not rich enough that you can afford an extra pod every three days at $43 per, these are your only two options in the pump, in pump land until now. Hmm. Okay, so, so we're easier to use, we're less full featured, We've eliminated complexity, we've eliminated extra hardware, but we also are not asking you like the Libre did to sacrifice accuracy. We are just as accurate as the leading pumps. In fact, we think once cleared, we might be the safest pump on the market because we pump, we pump with unique differentiated technology that uses negative pressure because the FDA's biggest concern about pumps when they go to clear them is, will it fail open? Because if that 2 ml or 3 ml reservoir dumps into the patient all at once, the patient is dead in two to three minutes. Jeez. So this is a really nasty technical problem. Even though you buy the insulin separately and inject it into the device, this is a problem where you can never fail open. You have to pump with roughly five to 6% average accuracy at smaller than a 200th of a drop. You can't agitate the mixture too much because the main preservative in the insulin is zinc based. You have to, um, you can't use most kinds of plastic because the other preservatives will leach into them. And you have to do it all at a form factor and at a cost point that people can afford and will wear. It's a nasty problem and it's very easy to go down the wrong direction, spend 20 or $30 million and only at the end realize that you're never gonna get there. So we think we have a differentiated safe pumping technology. We have eight families of patents around the way that we pump insulin, um, only a few of which have issued. So we think we have good long-term patent protection. And we did something else too, in addition to redesigning the pumping method to make it safer. And, and just to be clear, you can't patent pumping insulin anymore. That ship sailed a long time ago. You can only patent features, a safer way of doing it, a let and and in our case we've also patented a way of using off the shelf electronic components from the consumer electronics industry in this pump which is critical because these other products are beautifully designed relics of the past to be blunt i mean they are they are like trying to pump insulin with a rolex and we're trying to pump with a casio because our key electronic componentry comes from cell phones and drones the most optimized electronic supply chain the world has ever seen. And that's why, even though Insula does a billion dollars in revenue at scale, that plus the fact that our key electronics are detachable and use, can be used for 90 days and not for three, um, is why we can have a 50% lower cost of goods at scale than the leading patch pump. More on that point. So on the left is the Insula Omnipod. That's a cross section of it. And you can see it's got 75, more than 75 discrete components. Some, some digital, some analog, some still have to be put in place with tweezers. Automation alone for their last facility costs $65 million. On the right is my product. I can also hold up here. This is 12 molded plastic pieces in a coin cell battery. This is designed from the ground up for lights out, low cost, modern manufacturing. And we built a line that can do $75 million of this at two shifts in revenue um, for $6 million. So we think we've got a big advantage in terms of cost, scale, ease of use, very differentiated. But now let's talk about how these products are sold and how we could break into this market because this shocked me when I learned about it. The way these products are sold is that Right now, you go to your endocrinologist and say, I want to go on a pump. And the endo says, that's great. Congratulations. Here's here. Keep a diary for 60 days of all your diabetic events. How many carbs you had, how many units of insulin you had, what your blood sugar was. And at the end of that 60 days, and sometimes you can short circuit that a little bit if you're already wearing a CGM. But if you're starting from scratch, that's what you have to do. And at the end of the 60 days, you turn in the diary and they say, congratulations, you're eligible for a pump. Here are the business cards for Tandem Insulate and Medtronic. 
call the rep and they'll come to your house and they roll a quarter of a million dollar rep to your house to do a feature and benefit sale at the kitchen table as to why you should pick their product. And they're not doing that because they're stupid. They're doing it because the inherent nature of their product does not allow them to easily sample. If I leave you with this and you fill it up with insulin and then you put it on your body because you think you know how the quick start guide works and you haven't had the week of training that's required, you can kill yourself. Same is true of the other products. Even the Omnipod where you're throwing the whole thing away every three days still requires this. So there are two problems. The problem number one is the lack of training and, pro and the self-fill aspect. The problem number two is this is a $4,000 medical device. This is also a $4,000 medical device. And this is a lockdown cell phone. If I leave you with this, you might never bring it back. So economically, it's very hard to sample and leave people with those samples. We did a study in contrast of our product with 30 multiple daily injectors who had never used a pump before. And we said, what is this? And what would you do with it? We gave them our, our reusable, a dummy cartridge, and our quick start guide. Eight out of 10 in less than 10 minutes could put it on correctly and said it's a pump, obviously. That's unheard of in this space. And that enables a totally different selling model where we do what is done everywhere else in medicine. We sample the doctor and the nurse diabetes educator. And when someone who comes in with, you know, well, let's back up for a second. So the nurse diabetes educators, when you ask, well, you know, what would lead you to make it hard to not want to prescribe a pump to someone? One of the, one of the leading NDEs in the country said, said to me, well, when someone asks for a pump, I ask them to pull out their cell phone. And if it's an early model smartphone or a flip phone, I say, you can't handle a pump. And the reason they say that is if you've ever tried to teach, you know, parent, a spouse, someone else, how to use technology, and you know how burdensome that can be, you can see why they wouldn't want to take that on when they're dealing with something that has 1300 user configurable features. And so this solves a huge problem for them. When Felicia with the flip phone comes in and says, I want, I, I once again, am interested in a pump as I have been for the last 13 years, but I won't use one of those. Now, the nurse diabetes educator can send her home with this and say, why don't you watch a YouTube video? Let's talk about this. And then she comes back in and says, yeah, that totally works for me. It's a 20 minute training session. That enables a completely different selling model. And you don't need a very big sales force to access, access these nurse diabetes educators because there are only 4,000 endocrinologists who see patients in the US. Of those 4,000, 1,500 have ever written a pump script. Of those 1,500, 80% of the pump scripts come out of 1,000 of them. And those 1,000 are attached five to 10 at a time to a single nurse diabetes educator training practice that specializes in teaching people how to use pumps in their local area. Those are the practices we have to convert. And there are only a few hundred of them. And remember, not trying to convert. I'm not trying to go in there and say, you know, when is, how many Tandem T-Slim customers do you have rolling off their four-year warranty? We're going in and saying, how many Felicias do you have who have been asking about a pump for a long time and you haven't had something different to give them? What do the payers think about this? We surveyed a third of the commercial lives in the US and we asked, given that we wanna be on this prescription drug re benefit, which is, which is actually Insulet's biggest innovation, in my opinion. It's not the design of their product. It's the fact that they're willing to charge you like this is a pharmaceutical every three days. And then they amortize the cost of this over that period of time where you prescribe. So the insurer's big fear is that you're going, this is, this is going to become a paperweight, right? So they don't have that problem with the Omnipod. If you stop using it, the damage is done to Insulet's balance sheet because they're the ones that gave you the phone that, that is now no longer doing them any good. So we want to be on, on the prescription benefits so we don't have the upfront cost, but it, uh, just like Insulet. And we went to the payers and said, what kind of a rebate do we have to give you in order to be equal or preferred to insulate day one, given our, given our label would be the same, but we have a more limited feature set. And they said 10 to 20%. At a 20% rebate, I'm saving them $1,000 a year versus insulate on an annual basis. I'm not making them take the upfront risk. And they're getting people who weren't on a pump before on a pump. So they're getting that $10,000 a year long-term savings. What's not the like? <laughs> Anytime I talk about like first month free sampling, copay buy downs, all these other things that we're going to do like everyone else in medicine does in order to encourage usage, it makes me nervous just hearing it because you worry about, you know, how long is it going to take for this thing to break even? Well, luckily, because of the simple design of our product, 
and how efficient it is in terms of uh, in terms of fixed costs. We break you even if we give you the first month free. X cost of Salesforce at scale, we're profitable the first month that insurance pays for it. That's unheard of in this space. We don't think that insulate breaks even for more than a year after they had a customer because of that handset amortization. So, and in, in months where you're not getting a new reusable, we have almost pharmaceutical-like margins. So great unit economics. What, what kind of a model does this drive? Well, at 1% penetration of the people who require daily insulin, that's 36,000 concurrent users, and we have $150 million business, and we're profitable based on our current model. At a 2% at share, 72,000 concurrent users, we have a 20% operating margin. Insulate barely makes money at a billion in revenue. Tandem doesn't make money at a billion in revenue. We don't think that there's an easy route for them to cut costs, cut price to come after us. And why would they? We're in a different segment, an adjacent different segment, just like the Libre was with Dexcom. Where are we with the FDA? Well, so that because the FDA does not allow human trials in this in this space, except the human factor study to make sure people can understand the instructions. Um, this is a 510k predicate device review. And our current guidance is that we're going to submit around the end of this year. You know, our guidance in January was that it would be Q4. So we're around the end of the year currently. Um, once we submit, uh, the agency has it's not like a drug approval. The agency has, um, you know, 60-ish days to get back those questions. And then uh, then their clock stops. We have to respond. And then, you know, they, the average time for predicate device clearance right now at the agency is just under six months. So averages with the FDA are meaningless. But, you know, these are physical tests. We've had our pre-submission meeting. We know what the tests are. And, uh, and we feel reasonably confident and if something needs to be redone, we can do it and it shouldn't take an extraordinary amount of time to redo, but we will see. I'm gonna skip the roadmap because time. <laughs> um, recent events in the pumping space in terms of what's this thing worth? How would you value it right now? So a year ago, Tandem bought a startup in Switzerland called AMF Siggy for $70 million upfront and 140 million in earnouts and milestones. And on the call announcing the acquisition, they said that they um, they were planning to submit this product to the agency in early 2027. So they're four years behind us. And they were valued at 70 million upfront. Um, Medtronic in May of this year tendered to buy a com Korean company called EO Flow. Um, EO Flow has product that called the EO patch, which looks a lot like an Omnipod. In fact, it looks enough like an Omnipod that Insulate sued them for patent infringement, trade secret theft, and <laughs> and trade dress theft, and uh, got a restraining order. And the deal, Medtronic terminated the deal about a week ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think what's interesting about this deal is that Medtronic, Medtronic felt that they had enough of a product hole for a patch pump, that they were willing to spend $740 million for a product that essentially offered them no material differentiation with the insulin Omnipod. So look, I don't know what Medtronic's going to do next. I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that Medtronic's going to buy us tomorrow. I'm just merely suggesting that, you know, a differentiated way of moving insulin so you don't run into an IP thicket and, uh, and having a patch pump is desirable at Medtronic sort of set, set a level at which they saw value at something that wasn't as differentiated as us, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, in order to get make progress in this space, you have to have a good team. And, you know, we're not a bunch of 23-year-olds who just graduated from Stanford who are like, well, I have this cool pumping technology I invented in the lab, and maybe we can figure out this FDA thing. The last major platform that was cleared in this space was designed and gotten through the FDA by our chairman and CTO, Paul DePerna. Um, and he also did Ivera Medical, which is an unrelated product, which was sold, you know, basically the day it got cleared to 3M. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess my, my point there is one, we're not afraid to monetize things if there's a strategic there and two, this isn't the only good idea we're ever going to have. So we're not going to be wedded to it if the right, if the right price emerges. And obviously our hearts are in, and our hearts are in the right place because 
you know, my cash comp here is a dollar as CEO. Um, I'm the PM of the largest institutional shareholder, Manchester Management, and we own 12% of the company. And, uh, you know, the only equity comp that I've gotten as CEO is 150,000 options, which will be canceled or voided if we don't submit to the agency by the end of January. So, uh, you know, I and the, um, the employees who have gotten off, who've got similar options are all incented to do, to, um, to make progress on that front. <laughs> um, so I'm entirely aligned with the common shareholders in terms of creating shareholder value. Uh, capital structure is really simple. Ticker's MODD, we're on the NASDAQ. There are 21 million shares outstanding. Uh, obviously this is from May, so this is the, the stock price isn't terribly relevant. Uh, we've got significant insider ownership and we have some 5 million warrants at $1.22, 1.3 million penny warrants from a single institutional investor, uh, which were pre-funded. And, uh, and then we have 6 million warrants up at 660. So um, I've hustled through this and uh, I think, John, do you think, have I missed something? Are we ready for questions? What are we, what are we yeah. going to do now? I think there's, yeah, I think we, you know, if there's any questions that anyone has still, please just send them in through the Zoom chat. We'll try to get them answered. But there, uh, you addressed a, a number of them through the presentation that we had in the lineup. Um, you know, I think if, uh, in, in the last point that you mentioned of the alignment uh, that you've, uh, you know, smartly and interestingly set your the way that you will evolve and uh, benefit from the situation and to pay yourself a dollar in this world, I, it's kind of unheard of it, it, what I see in the small company space, um, been in it for a while. So what you've done here is very, is very intriguing. And I think most people can respect if they take a minute to really think about what you just told them. Uh, it's very interesting. So, um, you know, as far as it, it, these these players in the space, I know it's hard. You can't. You're not in their minds. You don't know what would trigger a buyout or win, or if ever. Right? Um, one can only speculate. But how would you? How would you? How would you look at this? You get a, and you mentioned that Paul's recent company got through FDA and immediately got purchased. I think you said it was for 150 million in one yeah. conversation. Have you? That's right. Yeah, I mean, how do you how do you Well, see that had, that company by the way had nothing to do with diabetes. So, yeah. just just so we're all clear. Fair okay. Enough. Fair enough. But the, the, obviously Paul's proven to be able to understand the process and the companies he's been with to move products through. He's he's an amazing. I mean, you think he said he's got a number of patents added to his name today um uh, that he just continues to to create. So, and I think one of the comments you mentioned was that, you know, he's he's very motivated to move forward and to continue to evolve other products. What, how would you say, is he aligned to here in this process? And, and Oh, very much, very much, because, you know, he's the third largest shareholder still. And he is, you know, the reason I say that he's willing to do other products is just that, you know, occasionally you meet the scientific founder and they want to hold on to this, your the product, regardless of what the right thing is to do for the asset with all 10 bony fingers, because they are afraid that this is the only good idea they're ever going to have. And if they were to sell this, they would relinquish control. And now what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I don't think Paul has that fear. He's been, he's done other things. He'll happily do other things again. If, if, if the right thing to do is to run this thing is to run the R and D side of the operation for this company for the next five years, he'll do that. Yeah. But if the right thing to do is to hand someone else the keys, we'll do that too. Okay. And then that's, that, that is, that's the point there. And, uh, and, you know, and just, just to put an even finer point on it, like I've said this in other investor presentations, I'll say it again here. Um, it would, it would be a disservice to our shareholders not to explore what the market would pay for this upon clearance and the strategic acquirers that potential acquirers that we've talked to all say, look, I want to see two things. I want to see the potential to scale, which is why we built the $6 million line. And I want to see FDA correspondence indicating that you're going to be clear. Because I do not want to be messing around with the FDA three or four years from now. So I can't help on the FDA yet, but we're going to get on the clock as soon as we can. 
and we've done our best to address the scalability issue, which is a very material issue. And and as I've said, I'd like look, we're gonna we're gonna absolutely hire a banker with two mandates around clearance. Mandate one is what would a strategic pay for us in an auction, and mandate two is with a hopefully much lower cost of capital, what would it cost us to raise the money to ramp this thing up and run to daylight? And I mean, you, we've already gone over my incentive. I'm incented to do whatever is the best risk adjusted return for the shareholders. And that's good. It's good that everyone, it's good that everyone's incented that way. And, and by the way, and I, I guess, let me give you one other piece of color. So we, we did our first trade show ever where we had a booth at the Nurse Diabetes Educator Trade Show in Houston, Texas in August. And we had a booth next to Medtronic Tandem and Insulate, and they each sent one trainer over, and then they sent the whole booth over. And we asked every last one of them, do you think there's a market for our product? And do you think it's competitive with yours? All of them said, there is a big market for this product. No, it's not competitive with ours. And then many of them said, gosh, I wish I had this in my bag. Because they know how many doctors there are in their territories who current who just refuse to write the current pumps or say, no, that patient won't work with that pump. So I think I think we represent a very nice accretive asset for a lot of different companies. And and because we think we can access a good chunk of the market with only 20 reps, we could be a vehicle where you could enter this market without spending half a billion dollars trying to go head to head at the kitchen table with the with the big three. Interesting. And that's important. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you can think of that would be a hurdle between now and then with, with the FDA to, to, that would, you know, slow your progress or prevent it from getting through? How do you feel? How do you see it? Well, anyone that says that they know exactly what the FDA is going to do is lying <laughs> in general, because, you know, it's it's they're their own agency. They're going to review our docs. They're going to look at our tests. I'll just say, you know, there were approximately 24 physical tests that they've asked us, that they asked us in our pre-sub meeting to do that would would lead to a clearance for our pump and a label that looked like the other pumps. And by the way, it's a 510k predicate device application. So the predicate device, you have to pick a predicate device. Our predicate device is this. It's the Tandem T-Slim. Who knows this application better than the guy who literally designed the product and wrote it and wrote the application? So I, I feel pretty good about us comparing ourselves to the T-Slim. And I feel pretty good about us, um, you know, having thought through the regulatory risks and, is, and you know, if, if they do come back and say, repeat this test or that test, it really depends on what the test is. Mm -hmm. the test is biocompatibility, that can be longer. Um, I think that's unlikely, honestly, at this point. I think if it's, if it's uh, mechanical, some other mechanical test, most of those tests we do internally, and then you're looking at, you know, a couple of weeks. So, you know, just eager to get on that clock. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, and and by the way, by the way, John, I I, I should also say like <laughs> when when we use vague and opaque language like around your end, I I want to put a little bit more of a finer point on that because I don't want to I want, don't want to confuse people. Like the reason we say around is that there are there's one final documentation review that's a third party that's done by a third party that we really have no control over. Um, and that's not to say that it could come in in February, but that's to say that given holiday scheduling and so on, do we really have any sense as to whether or not that's going to come in right at the end of December or whether or not it's going to come in the second week of January? And the answer is, I don't know. Yeah. But honestly, you know, that's just more time for us to clean up the application, you know, repeat, you know, do redundant tests if necessary, et cetera, in order to get the application in the best possible shape we can have it in to get as few questions as possible on the first go round. So that makes sense. Uh, there's one, one, uh, one question that came in that is around this eFlow Korean company Medtronic situation, yeah. you know, it, and how your product compares to that and why would possibly Medtronic look at replacing this situation uh, what benefits could you see that they, you know, you get it through the process and they, uh, you know, why would they be looking at you? Well, the insulate lawsuit suggested that 
the EO patch was an Omnipod without the auto injector. That's what it suggested. And that, you know, from afar, that's kind of what the product looks like. And so Medtronic might've been able to make that work from a commercial standpoint, because they already have the brand name. They already have the sales force. They're the only company that does both a pump and a CGM. Although, you know, I would argue that both of them are sort of the, you know, the farthest behind in terms of tech, but they're the, but they're the most tightly integrated. And I have met, I have met parents who have their kid wear a Dexcom CGM and then they have them wear a Medtronic CGM and a Medtronic pump as well in order to get the best possible integration. Um, so I think their thought was, well, we can integrate this with our CGM. We can put some algos on it. We can Medtronicize this and go after a different part of the market. Um, and because they already have the brand name and the Salesforce presence, that might have worked for them. But remember, we already compete with the Omni. If this is essentially an Omnipod, I'm not, I'm just not, I just wasn't that concerned about it, to be honest, because that's a different segment of the market. And remember, our users have been looking at the Omnipod since 2008 and saying, that's not going to work for me for one or more reasons, right? So, so one, I don't think, I don't worry about their current, the design of their current product in terms of, uh, in terms of our customers necessarily, because they, they are very familiar with an Omnipod. Um, two, why would Medtronic look at us? Well, now, now they know that IP around, uh, you know, looking exactly like insulin might not be acceptable from an IP perspective. The way we move insulin is fundamentally different than insulin. Our trade dress is very different in terms of being a two-part pump, having the button on the product, having this little tail, which allows you to use Velcro, um, or a less, aggressive form of adhesive in terms of attaching it to your body and then also being able to clear an occlusion by just unclicking this and then throwing the needle away. Like all of these things are fundamentally different features for us than a Neopatch or an Omnipod. So mm -hmm. I think Medtronic would just have to appreciate that we're targeting a different market segment that's adjacent to them. Does that mean that there aren't advantages to being tightly integrated? You know, if they, if they were to try and acquire us to being tightly integrated to their CGM or you know, being part of the other things that they do. Well, of course, of course, there might be some advantages to that, but that's for them to know, not for us to know, frankly. I mean, it's, it's, this is very fresh. This deal broke last Wednesday. Yeah. It's a little premature for us to say that Medtronic is going to rush back into the fray and immediately try and do something else. Um, I'm not privy to their thinking, obviously, but I wasn't privy to their thinking when they entered into the EOFLO transaction to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Well, if someone's trying to think about it from your point of view and, you know, uh, as an investor, I think you probably get way better than most people at, at, uh, with this question is that, you know, with the size of the market they can potentially fill, how, mm -hmm. how can one back into modeling mod? Like how would, you know, if you're successful in getting this through and grabbing the market, I mean, how do you, how, how would, how do you get can yeah, you... I mean, you're looking at it. You're looking at a pretty small N in terms of in terms of uh, companies and the way they're valued, right? Like Insulet's valuation, typically, uh, all they're taking all this share has been, you know, bouncing between eight and ten times revenues mm -hmm. on a marginally profitable business. Um, so that's, I guess, that's one way to look at it. If you look at, you know, what our what our initial TAM is of three billion dollars, and you try and guesstimate what our penetration would be. Um, or you take my 2% penetration at current at a 20% discount to insulin, which would be a $300 million business. So you could use, you could back into it using a revenue multiple. You could use the simple cheat that I use, which is that there's never been a public company that was, that was listed that had an insulin pump that was cleared that didn't achieve a $300 million valuation after clearance. Um, they didn't always keep it. I mean, you know, Valeritas torched, 800 and something million dollars of investor money before they finally went into liquidation. But even after all that, they still had $170 million EV when they liquidated, when they were liquidated because of a manufacturing problem. <laughs> um, Tandem, when they went public in 2013, had a $480 million cap. They burned half a billion dollars. They got all the way down to 40. And then in Medtronic had a big recall and J&J &J exited the pump business and they took off and went to a multi-billion dollar market cap very, very quickly. Um, you know, Insulate, when they went public way back in 2008, 2009, had a $330 million cap and on $2 million in revs and negative gross margins, years away from getting on the right reimbursement schedule. So 
those are the public comps. And then let's let's go back and look at the private comps again. You know, you've got the, you've got Medtronic who was willing to pay 740 million for an Omnipod lookalike. You've got this year. Now, granted, they were cleared in Europe, although they had already been kicked off the market in Europe for patent infringement. And uh, and then they had applied for clearance in the U.S. And I think without the lawsuit, you know, why wouldn't you believe that another Omnipod could get cleared looking like an Omnipod? Yeah. Um, so so that's so I don't think I don't think the FDA was the big is is the big showstopper with EOFlow. Um, and then and then you've got Beta Bionics, which just got a pump cleared, which form factor wise isn't that different than this. Um, it's a tube based pump. You wear it on your belt. It's got a much easier to use algorithm that's less accurate than the other algorithms that are on the market, but there's less work to it. Uh, they just raised $100 million at, I think it looks like a $200 million pre uh, to go into the teeth of the market and market at the kitchen table against these other guys. So I don't know how that's going to go, but that's, you know, that's up to them. And then um, what are the other? And then, of course, there's the Siggy, AMF Siggy deal. Which was consummated, which was seventy million up front and one hundred forty million in earnouts and milestones for something that was four years away from submission. So I mean, you know, it's it's some it's somewhere on that spectrum. I think I think trying to do this on a you're going to end up with a, a you know a range that you could drive a truck through if you try yeah. and do it some kind of a DCF valuation uh, right now. I think it's what what's it i think the valuation is to some extent what's it worth to the industry and i think it's it's potentially if cleared a, a very valuable asset for a lot of different players for different reasons in each case yeah it sounds like to me based on what you just said there is that th th there could be suitors coming in before fda uh, uh clearance if uh, well, it, it's a possible well, John, let, let me let me give you a cautionary note on that. Okay. So so the reason that the reason that I would suspect that it's going to take clearance in order to in order to have something that people would want would even like seriously consider transacting on is well, there are two reasons. One, there were three well-funded startups, Secure Valeritas before they went with the Vigo, but when they had a type one product and CQ, and uh, so Secure Valeritas and Celnovo who between 2011 and 2021, all were well-funded startups that tried to get a pump clear. And none of them actually got over the goal line, all of which pressurized the insulin reservoir, had other technical issues and could never get the FDA comfortable that they wouldn't dump the insulin into the patient and spent an awful lot of time on a beautiful interface to help the patient manage the pump before figuring out how you actually pump insulin. Whereas I would say, um, I would say that our biggest differentiation is in the hardware and that's unusual. Mm. These other guys have not changed their hardware basically since they've gotten clear. They've changed the interface. They've added algorithms. They've added sophistication. They've added features. They've added cell phone integration. They haven't changed the hardware because the DNA to do that in a lot of ways doesn't exist there anymore. I see. So in, in, in five to 10 years from now, you're going to need a product on your body still that delivers insulin. And the winner in that space is going to be lowest cost, best form factor, safest way of pumping. And what and who's on whose phone app is controlling said pump? I have no idea. Is it Apple Health? Is it Google Health? Is it yeah. is it Lavongo? <laughs> is it Dexcom? I don't know. And frankly, we're kind of agnostic. That's not where we differentiate ourselves. We differentiate ourselves based on low cost, ease of use, safety. Yeah. Um, Let's see. So, oh, oh, so, so the other, the other example that I wanted to give you is so the last before Tandem bought Siggy, the last pump transaction was when Roche bought a company called Snap out of Israel for 170 million dollars in 2010. And the reason I mentioned that is Roche then took another nine years to get the pump cleared. <laughs> so thus, yeah, thus. I think people are a little gun shy because of that experience. And, and before before three different pump platforms were cleared in the last nine months, there really hadn't been a major pump platform cleared in uh, since 2011. Well, I mean, with only six months expected into this time frame, it's it's going to be here before we know it through this process. This is a very short duration uh, to see how it, it comes out, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, this is this is exciting, Jeb. I know we've uh, extended here. There were a lot of great questions. Uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, I will be uh, 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 publishing the video for this event at the Tri Public YouTube channel at, at some point today. Once I get through my, the rest of my meetings, but uh, I'm excited to get that up there and, and uh, get that out. And then we'll also get the tribe this week out at about 1:15 Pacific today connect all of you and try to include that video in the uh, this event in there if I can or a link to it uh, so anybody that hasn't will be able to see it. Um, if, you, if you didn't get any uh, all of your questions answered, please just send them to me. We'll try to connect you with Jeb at some point and also get him back, uh, back out to uh, many of the cities we're coming to in the U.S. And I know Jeb's excited to do that. Uh, and so let us know if you want to meet him in person and understand us a bit a bit clearer. And uh, Jeb, I want to say thank you today for taking the time to help us better understand this opportunity at Modular. And um, you continue to get me excited about why I've been investing in this company, and I'm excited to see how this plays out. Um, any any last words that you you have, Jeb? Uh, no, thanks. Thanks everyone for for the attention and the interest and uh you know yeah it, it'd be obviously i would look forward to meeting meeting all of you in person at some point since story tells itself a lot better when you can actually touch and hold the devices and see why there's a difference well thanks again jeb thanks again Major medical and uh, remember uh the symbol is m-o-d-d -D. uh ping me anytime ping jeb uh at a later event and uh, jeb thanks again for for joining us today have a have a great weekend Thank you. Appreciate it, John.